This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 23 for March 5th, 2009, from sunny New York. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm Dick DePommier. And I'm Alan Dove. And where are you, Alan? I am in sunny Massachusetts. It's sunny there as well? Yes, it is. Well, welcome back to TWIV, everyone, the weekly show about viruses. Quite, we have quite a bit today, so let's get right into it. Here, here. First thing, what was it on the 3rd of March? What day was it, Alan? It was square root day. Oh, my God. Is that, is that geeky or what? <laughs> That's very geeky. Okay, it's square root day because it's 339. Oh, uh, right. And that doesn't happen very often, right? True. You know, it wasn't really square root day. It was square day, wasn't it? Yeah, you're right. Oh, Let's I get see. technical. It's I true. See. I But see. three is the square root of nine. Right. Well, and on the 14th, it'll be pi day, 314. Ah, that's very good. It's great. Excellent. So we start with geekdom and we continue with geekdom. Uh, Harold Varmus was on The Daily Show Monday night. I hope he did okay. Do you know The Daily Show? I do. So I found yes. a clip online of it, and I put it on my blog, Virology blog, which is virology.ws. Go see it. He did a great job. Excellent. This guy is a great scientist. He won the Nobel Prize. Yep. He was head of NIH. Yep. He's head of Sloan Kettering. Yep. And he's a great guy on TV. And what else do you know about him? He went to medical school here this at Columbia. This is correct. That's yeah. exactly right. And he's an avid bicyclist. He is. He's, right. he's, he's some advocate for allowing people to bicycle safely in New York City, I believe. Right. right. Good luck on that. But he, uh, on the show, his big thing was he is pushing for science. He's defending science. He said at the previous administration, it wasn't supported. Now we're back, but scientists need to get out there and talk about science. Correct. Which is what we're doing, right? You bet. On TWIV. For most of the part. So go check out the video. It's only six minutes, and you can see this guy's really good. I mean, he bantered with John Stewart. John Stewart says, "You had you got a Nobel Prize, didn't you?" Uh, Harold goes, "Yeah, but that was a long time ago." <laughs> and Stewart goes, "Yeah, pff, yeah." Right. What have you done lately? <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Right. I don't watch TV, but it was fun to watch that. Right. All right. I'm going to complain, Alan. We talked about antiviral resistance to flu months ago here on TWIV. Yes. So I think when a story breaks, you talk about it, and then that's it until something new happens. The press keeps hammering on and on about this. What is going on? Yeah, I was watching this too, and I kept seeing these stories come up about, uh, you know, it's uh, it's resistant, it's right. resistant, right. it's resistant. Right. Over and over. Yeah, over and over. I, I call this the echo chamber. Um, so this is this is something that, that actually used to go on even before we had 100 million blogs where, you know, you'd get a, a story that would come out um, in a newspaper and then a radio station would pick it up. And a day later, you'd hear the same thing on the radio, but then the Associated Press would pick it up and the Associated Press story would run in a bunch of other newspapers. So you'd get this kind of feedback loop going. But back then, it didn't normally last very long. What we have now is, of course, all this stuff becomes the fodder of of all these blogs and discussion forums. That's and right. Everybody jumps on board and spouts their own opinion about it. Um, and then all that creates all this traffic and, and discussion online. And the traditional media, who probably reported the story in the first place, because they're the, still the source of most of the original content, <laughs> um, they see that there's all this quote-unquote buzz about flu resistance. So some editor or producer says, oh, wow, we really ought to do another story about that because <laughs> That's right. it's, it's all the buzz. So then two weeks later, you see uh, this flu antivirals thing, right about the time we talked about it, it was also covered in the New York Times. Right. If you can't get around reading the Times, you should at least listen to TWIV because we will get you the news first. We will. That was the initial coverage. But then there's been all this buzz, and now we've seen another round of coverage because the, the major news outlets are saying, oh, well, this is the thing to talk about. So they're doing all these additional stories about resistance. Of course, as you point out, nothing new has happened. We've still got the same information. But there was, at least locally here in Massachusetts, there was one incident that kind of spurred some of the local media to take this on. A kid in, I think, a prep school. Uh, we have prep schools here in Massachusetts. I don't know if you were aware. <laughs> one kid got flu and died of it. Yes, I heard that, yeah. 
as you know, this has been a very slow flu season, thankfully. So it was noteworthy that of the of the few infections that have occurred, one of them was deadly. You know, as happens, it's a deadly virus. But that story then touched off more interest in flu and people were interested in hearing about the antivirals again. So I, I think I think it's a combination of the echo chamber and uh, and incidents like that that are now just happening late in the, in the flu season. It's very obvious because the Times picked it up again. Uh, U.S. News, Newsweek, they've all had articles. I got a call last Friday from a reporter from the Chicago Tribune who had seen it on my blog weeks ago and did a story on Monday. It just gets rehashed over and over again. And here we are rehashing the rehash. Yes, and here we are. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm very sorry to do that. I'm glad to hear the explanation from Alan. But the thing is, if you just get vaccinated, you don't need to take antivirals. It's not a big deal. And the vaccine is pretty good. It's pretty effective. So. Yep. Okay, now on to real science. Okay. Yes. Bring Our it on. first story is a PNAS paper that came out uh, just a few days ago, March 2nd. A macaque model of HIV-1 infection. Pigtailed macaques. HIV-1 doesn't infect monkeys. There are intracellular blocks to replication. There are various host restriction proteins that block it. So if you want to do animal studies, you have to use SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, which isn't the same animal. It's very different. So let's say you want to make a vaccine. What you do is you put HIV envelope proteins onto SIV. You infect monkeys, you challenge them, you do all your studies there. Then if it works out, then you have to do HIV, but you can't do very much because there's not an animal model. So these people engineered HIV so it would grow in macaques. So it turns out that the one there's only one intracellular restriction protein for HIV in macaque cells. It's a protein called apobec, which is a deaminase. Normally, apobec gets incorporated into the HIV virion, and then it, chew, it deaminates the uh, RNA and it degrades. So the macaque apobec would do this to the HIV genome and block infectivity. There is a protein, an HIV protein called VIF, which is in the virion and degrades apobec. Spy versus spy. The HIV VIF doesn't degrade macaque Apobec, but the macaque or the simian VIF, SIV VIF, does. So they engineered simian VIF into HIV. It infects macaque. Cool, isn't it? Very. Yeah. It means you also understand the biology of the virus. One of the things Harold Varmus pointed out on the Daily Show clip, actually, was you, you got to have the basic science in order to get the, the medicine. But if it works and you only made one change, it means you understand why that was well, not Well, they did other things. So actually the envelope of HIV was also adapted. Oh, okay. So it's not a perfect model. Oh, okay. But it's good because it's mostly HIV. Fair enough. And it, they make a viremia in these animals. It, the T cells are important for regulating it. They show in the paper. And if you treat them with antivirals, it reduces viral load. So it's not a bad model. But they themselves say in the discussion, don't get too excited about this for vaccine development. It uses a macaque-adapted envelope. It doesn't use CCR5 co-receptor. It doesn't deplete CD4 cells. And there's no sustained replication for years as we do observe in human infections. So it's not a perfect model, but it's a start. On the other hand, you know, how many perfect animal models do we have for human diseases? Uh, yes, you're right. There's, it's why we call them animal models. The model is the... I find it refreshing that the authors of this study. Gave the caveats. Gave the caveats. And the author, first author is Theodora Hatsioanu. I don't know if I got it right, and Paul B. Nash. And they're at the Aaron Diamond downtown here in New York and the Rockefeller. Nice start. I think that's good. And they admit there's more to be done and they will do it. Okay, the next story, role for Epstein-Barr virus in multiple sclerosis. You know, multiple sclerosis is one of these demyelinating diseases yeah, 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 a human yeah. pro progresses over many years. Very sure. bad. People for years have been trying to find a viral etiology. So maybe we should review what Epstein-Barr virus actually causes first. Oh, it's one of these herpes viruses. Is it now? It is a gamma herpes virus. I'll be darned. It is not the same uh, group of herpes as herpes simplex, which is an alpha, but it's a gamma, and, and in there is HHV8, which is Kaposi's sarcoma virus. So EBV causes mononucleosis. That's a common disease in people. In this country. In this country. And yes. in Africa, it causes... Burkitt's lymphoma. Thank you. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Pharyngitis also. It's quite a common infection. Respiratory transmission. A large envelope DNA virus, okay. They, this study, they looked at 135 patients who had MS, and they measured their brain volume, 
and decreasing gray matter, and then looked at, at baseline and three years later, and then they measured antibody to EBV. So the results show that higher levels of anti-EBV antibody measured at the beginning of the study were associated with an increased loss of gray matter over three years. So those patients with higher antibodies did worse in the study. Did they look at their antibodies to any, did they look at their antibodies to any other common pathogens? Not in this paper, no. I wonder why they focused on EBV. Let's see if I can glean that from the abstract. Well, what I was getting at is um, MS is widely believed to be at least partly an autoimmune disease. So if you've got it, one possibility is that what they're actually seeing is more active immune system in the people who had more sure. gray matter. So here's why they looked at ABV. A growing body of evidence indicates a role for EBV in MS. The occurrence of mono mononucleosis caused by EBV in susceptible adolescents and young adults has been linked to the risk of developing MS. So ah. there was some previous risk, so that's why they did this antibody study. But of course, this is just a correlation here. There's no causation proved by this study whatsoever, which of course right. is difficult. In this, what they're going to do now is what they call a prospective longitudinal study. Now, we are not epidemiologists. Are you, Dick, an epidemiologist? I'm not. No, I'm an ecologist. A longitudinal study is a correlational study that involves repeated observations of the same thing over long periods of time, often decades. Prospective means you go forward in time as opposed to retrospective, right, when you look back. So sure. they need to, they're going to take patients and look for many years and see what happens. But it's going to be, in the end, correlative, right? Right. You're going to correlate antibody levels with a development of MS. It doesn't right. prove causation. And this nope. is the kind of the trouble we get into with epidemiological studies. The public really doesn't understand this. It's not easy to understand. Are there animal models for MS? Uh, yes, but not by EBV. Aha. Uh -huh. There are animal models for demyelin demyelinating diseases, and an epicornavirus is one of the models, but not with EBV for sure. So that's the key, Dick. You need If you had an animal model, it would really help. That's right. So you get strong epi data, and then you go into an animal. Well, I guess the, the standard animal model for MS is, the, is EAE. In experimental allergic encephalitis. Exactly. How do you trigger uh -huh. that, Alan? That is chemically triggered, uh, and uh, there's also I think there's also a, a transgenic mouse that develops it. But it's it, you know it's it's artificial like all model systems, and there are yeah. all these caveats. It is it does provide a pretty good model of the demyelination, but I don't know I don't know if there's a good experiment that you could do looking at uh, whatever the mouse version of EBV um, or, a, or an appropriate mouse herpes virus. I, I don't know if that would be close enough to reality to be useful. What's the evidence that something cross-reacts between EBV virus antigens and brain tissue? I don't know that there is, in this case, that, that sort of evidence. Right now, it's just at the level of correlating the antibodies with the disease. But that's one possibility that it would be a cross-reactive response, yes. Yes, because yes, they think type 1 diabetes might be something sure. like that as well. I hope in the longitudinal study that they're going to do some kind of um, control antibody, some other common condition that you could and look at. And since EB virus is so commonly distributed throughout the human population, it probably is a subset of people with genotypes which favor this cross-reacting antigen that you might want to look at and compare I them I mean, to in us. this study also, the control group is very important. Right? Absolutely. Because you have to make sure there aren't other variables that are factoring in. I think that's very hard to do. Probably lots of them. <laughs> Especially when you're looking at a particular disease, you that's have right. to match them. And exactly. Yeah, human studies like this are, are extremely difficult and, and slow to do. Yep. So are there clusterings in terms of genetics, family histories that uh, favor MS in families rather than... Don't know the answer. I don't. That's a very good question, which uh, is beyond my knowledge at okay. the moment. Uh, another question I have from the innocent uh, standpoint here of somebody who doesn't work in this field at all. Once you have EB virus and you... If you... If you develop mononucleosis and then you cure yourself, so to speak, and you get over it, are you really cured? Is there a latency period afterwards? Is there a, a lifelong protection, or do you get it again some other time? You do. You do cure it. You do clear it at, at some point, and you are immune to subsequent right. infection. It doesn't just sit around. Doesn't waiting sit around about forever. It. As okay, far as fine. We know. It's not like a herpes virus that you'd get from, like, say, sexual contact. You do know the difference between herpes and true love, right? Yes, we do. Herpes is forever. That's that's bad. You know, Alan. I that's did, a, I didn't know if I'd used that on Twiv. Yet. That's an that's an '80s joke. It's okay. He he's used it, and that's it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Next story: Baxter admits contaminated seasonal flu product contained live bird flu virus. Oh my god! Oops. Oh, this how is from could Pro, anything like that happen? ProMed male officials are trying to get to the bottom of how ma vaccine oh manufacturer god. Baxter made experimental virus material based on a human flu strain 
but contaminated with H5N1 avian flu and then distributed it to an Austrian company. So they had been making this H3N2 vaccine. They distributed it, but it was contaminated with H5N1. All killed virus, of course. No. No, live virus. The way they found out was that their subcontractor in Czechoslovakia injected this prep into uh, ferrets, right? Right. Oh, and they died. Yeah. They died. Which is not from the H3N2. Right. Right. So the H5N1 was live. Good heavens. Unbelievable. And they say here that 36 (laughs) or 37 people who were exposed to the product became infected. I don't know which virus they were infected with. doesn't say in this ProMed report. But, you know, one of the things here, besides the horror of the whole thing, it's really, you have to be so careful that these, if both viruses infected people, they could have recombined and made what nature has failed to do so far, right? Could. Make a recombinant with the H5 that's quite virulent. Because we know that H3N2 has got what you need to to grow in people. For that matter, um, the co-infected ferrets could they could <laughs> too, sure. They could sneeze at a person and give them Good this heavens. recombinant. I guess the moral here is that no matter what precautions you take, accidents will always happen because people are fallible, right? Yes. I got to get out of here in a half hour, pick up my kid at gate daycare, boom, mix it up. It's yep. never going to be prevented until we have Cylons doing our experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, of course, arises immediately, and that maybe it wasn't an accident. That's giving people a lot of credit. I don't think mm-hmm. so. But that's yeah. a good point. When, when, there's a, when there's a choice between um, you know, stupidity and malice, I'm always going with stupidity. Oh, no, me too. Me too. That's a good, that's but, a good saying. I like that. You could have both in the same person, by the way. It is the second most common element in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> if someone wanted to do this intentionally, it would be much more widespread and yes. focused. This is... An accidental thing, but it's well taken, Dr. De Palmier. Anyway, so I was I emailed a fellow who uh, is working on this, see if he could join us at some point and tell us more, so maybe he will. The guy who works uh, for the government, the U.S. government. Yeah, I don't imagine you'll get somebody from Baxter on the... Uh, no. no. Influenza virus. Okay, and now our, our final uh, academic story for the day. This was in PLOS 1. Evidence for directional selection at a novel major histocompatibility class 1 marker in wild common frogs exposed to a viral pathogen, ranavirus. This is very cool. This So apparently, and I didn't know this, there's an epidemic of this ranavirus infection in frogs in the UK. Did you know this, Dick? I did not. As an ecologist, no? I knew that there was a worldwide fear that the number of frog species are decreasing, though, as a result of global climate change. Yes. Well, apparently this virus, which is a big DNA virus, by the way, related to a virus we're going to talk about in a few moments, uh-huh. it's wiping out the, the population, uh, tens of thousands of deaths a year in the frogs. And, you know, I had not heard about this at all. But anyway, in this study, they, they sequenced the MHC class 1 locus of survivors and dead frogs to compare them. Now, MHC1 is really involved in viral resistance because it's the cell surface protein that presents viral antigens to immune cells, right? right. This is an ancient, an ancient yep. gene. Exactly. It was in sharks present in all vertebrates, and it is probably the most diverse diverse gene in the vertebrate genome. Is that yes. right? There are a thousand alleles in humans. Wow. Yeah. And so people over the years have tried to associate specific alleles with disease resistance. And in particular, there are two associated with resistance to HIV and HCV. So there's one called HLA-B27, which is linked to HIV resistant. HLA-B57 is linked to HCV resistance. So what they did here is to see if there's any particular allele. Sure. And they find sequences in the resistant frogs that are consistent. Now, are these frogs from a frog supplier, or are these wild frogs? These are wild frogs. Wild. Yeah, they go out and because collect them, yeah. raising frogs is a big business, and is pl- it? frog diseases are big, uh, big money losses. Yeah, sure they are. Uh, is it a business for eating? Yes. Frog legs? Yes. And for science, for research. Mm-hmm. A lot of people use frogs, not just Xenopus lavus. They, they use ranopipians for a lot of things also. And uh, dissection in biology classes. Uh, that's all done virtually now, Alan. Really? I'm not kidding. Almost all wow. of it is a virtual dissection now. Wow. Yeah. But these things are, they produce a lot of interesting embryos that can be manipulated, and they do a lot of nuclear transplants and stuff like this. So this is cool because you have an outbreak, you have a plague going on, and you can look at the class one. And so basically they find that the 
so frogs that survive infection have a particular group of class one alleles, which suggests that they're involved, but it doesn't prove it, right? Nope, it does what not. What would prove you have it. to do, Dick, to prove it? Ah, uh, lots of experiments. Ah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> can you can you name one? Ah, uh, you'd probably have to take the susceptible frog genes and transpose them into resistant frogs and see if that matters. Can you do genetics in oh, frogs? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can overexpress this and give multiple copies in resistant frogs to see if you can overcome the resistance. And I would that's what I would think about doing. No, it has to be proven. You're absolutely right. But this is very interesting and it gives you a hypothesis that you can test, right? Yes. I can give you a little bit of background on the ecology of this, however, because the the claim not the proof, but the claim that global climate change is associated with ozone depletion, and ozone depletion allows more UVB radiation through, UVB radiation causes an AIDS-like syndrome in frogs. And so no matter where the frogs are, they will acquire diseases of their local environment at a higher rate than, than frogs with overexpressed photolyase. The photolyase enzyme actually corrects the thymine timers that are created by UVB radiation exposure. So there is a molecular biology to resistance in frogs, which relates to whether or not they produce a, a, a lot of photolyase or a little bit of photolyase. And a guy by the name of Andrew Blaustein, working out of Oregon State University, has done some very clever experiments in lakes up in the uh, Cascades by putting lucite cages that are open on the bottom over uh, strings of eggs in the water to protect them from UVB radiation. Mm -hmm. And the ones that hatch in that situation have 80% less birth defects than the ones that hatch without the, the cages that he puts over them. So, it was, it's very, cool. very neat stuff. And um, and wherever you look around the world, you've got an increase of, of loss of frogs. And there's there's a real price to pay here because frogs make a compound called meganins. And I think we've discussed this earlier. And meganins may be one of our last hopes for antibiotics that uh, work against certain microbes that we're susceptible to. And we're losing our natural capital in terms of the numbers of species. There are about 3,400 3, different anurine species. And it's probably less than that now. I, I like to jump in whenever there's a chance to I think, discuss uh, non-virology. No, no, I knew you would like this uh, because it involves uh, frogs and right, outdoors. Right, right. So here's the story. Common frog populations were chosen based on their disease history. Okay. Seven populations were chosen which had undergone yearly mortalities caused by the virus mm -hmm. for five generations, and then seven populations which had no history. Southeast of England, urban or suburban garden ponds, Frogs were captured by hand at each location. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's great. Uh, it's buried in the methods. Yeah. No, no fancy equipment. Yeah. Okay. Reminds you of something of a Calaveras County, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Before we go on to our extreme virology, a little word from the American Society for Microbiology. <laughs> On May 17th through the 21st at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, the American Society for Microbiology will hold its 109th general meeting, the largest annual gathering of microbiologists in the world. Visit the general meeting website at gm.asm.org to view the preliminary program, register for the meeting, or reserve your hotel stay. That's gm.asm.org. It's time for Extreme Virology. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're coming to a theater near you. <laughs> yeah, the extreme, the biggest and the smallest. I thought it would be just fun to go through a couple of these. The smallest autonomous virion, autonomous meaning it can replicate, right? as opposed to a satellite, which needs a helper. We have right. a class for those, too. But the smallest autonomous virion, what do you think, Dick? <sighs> this is the diameter of the virion. Diameter, oh. Uh, Take a guess. Flaviovirus is about 40 nanometers too big. This, this, oh, no, I understand that. It's about 10 nanometers. That's pretty small. I don't know a 10, but the circoviruses oh, are 11? 17 to 24 <laughs> nanometers. 17 to 24. Circovirus. Pretty small. Pretty small. Circoviruses wow. are these little... How well, big is tiny. its genome? We're going to talk about that because it actually has the smallest genome, too. Really? But they are viruses that cause diseases in chickens and various birds. Huh. Parrots, I think, there's a circovirus. There's an outbreak of in, uh, this virus in pigs. It's a disease called post-weaning multisystemic wasting syndrome. That's it. Isn't that good? Yeah, there's actually a vaccine for pigs because this is economically, and it's actually a emerging pig disease. So in other words, uh -huh. 
For some reason, it's on the increase. Monocultures will do that. The pig farms, yep. yeah. You bet. Now, there is a human circovirus. It's called TT virus, transfusion transmitted virus, or Tarketeno virus, first reported in a Japanese patient in 1997. Seems to be in everyone. 100% really? seroprevalence in really? some countries. I'm willing to bet that you, Dick, have really? antibodies to this, that I do, and that you do too, Alan, even over the mic. Quite awesome. So the human virus is similar. How is this acquired? Uh, transfusion, probably. But we so haven't we had transfusions. Come on. I've, I've never had a transfusion. I've never had a transfusion. But, uh, yeah. Well, Who knows? Uh, it must be transmitted by aerosol then because... Um, or at birth. We do not know what this causes. This TT virus is, is asymptomatic as far as we know. Uh, you know, it, it's in uh, 10% of blood donors in the UK and the US, but it's found in patients with liver disease. Really? Uh, and Alan had an idea about that, right? Yeah. So uh, I guess I gather patients with liver disease, you mean may or may be slightly more likely to carry it in places where it's not already 100% prevalent. One, you know, one possibility is maybe the, that population is more likely to have received transfusion. It could be, yeah. So, I mean, if but you don't pigs check... Pigs don't get transfused. Pigs don't get transfusion. It's probably an aerosol. Yeah. Pigs are, are eating. Or fecal so contamination. We really don't know um, how it's transmitted, but it seems to be in a lot of people. Wow. Well, and, you know, we think it's asymptomatic, but who knows? But in pigs, it causes wasting disease it of does. weanlings. Weanlings, yes. Not of newborns? Post-weaning. Post-weaning. That means that they've received all the maternal antibodies. Yeah. They received a jump start from mother's milk, yeah. and yet they still start to waste. So what does that say to you, Vince? The mothers were not infected. No, that the mother's milk doesn't contain the right antibody. The placental right. transfer of antibody right. is the right so antibody. So either they were not infected or it so didn't it, make a good antibody. It degrades over a period of time, right? Just like in humans. So in six months, you have half of what you had when you were born. So that means at that point, maybe that's when pigs become susceptible. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I do try to think like one sometimes. I like the name TT virus because I always liked Audi TTs. It's a good car. <laughs> The largest virion. A giant virus in amoeba. I'm showing Dick the paper that discovered this virus. It is Mimi virus. The name of it The name of it sounds like the fat lady singing. <laughs> What's the name of the uh, amoeba that it grows in, Dick? It's in there. I can't the amoeba polyphagia. You know that, you know that I amoeba? do know that one. Yes, Where do you I find do. that amoeba? You usually find that in water. Yeah, it's also in the ground. So this is the largest virion known. Very interesting. 400 nanometer capsid. Wow. But it's got these really strange filaments that project from the capsid, which end up making it about 600 nanometers or sometimes bigger. I've seen 800. Just about break a window with it. <laughs> you can see this in light microscope. <clears throat> in fact, the original study, they were studying Legionella in uh, water towers. And they thought this was a bacterium, and they just put the samples away in the freezer and forgot about them for a right. while. And at some point, they went back and found it was a bloody wow. virus. Wow. This is one of the most interesting viruses. Anyway, it's the biggest capsid. We'll get onto the genome in a moment. Uh, if, if you search PubMed for Mimi virus, you get 59 papers only. So this was discovered in 2003. So just a few groups work on it, but as you'll see, it's fascinating. Smallest viral genome, the circovirus genome. Right. It's a single-stranded circle of DNA, and it's 1.7 to 2.3 kb in length, and it encodes two proteins. Just two proteins. Yeah, one That's of which amazing. Is, what's the one protein it has to be? Well, it's got to get out somehow, doesn't it? Well, it's got a capsid, right? Capsid. Well, well, one of them has to be the capsid. So one course. is the capsid, which is an icosahedral capsid made up of one protein, and then there's another protein called a rep, which is involved in DNA replication. But it's not a polymerase, so this guy is very dependent on the host. Wow. Two proteins. Amazing. That's travel. Light. Yes, it is traveling light. <laughs> You'll get past the TSA with this one. So that's the smallest viral genome, non-defective genome. Wow. Just so that we uh, give RNA viruses a little time in the spotlight, the smallest RNA virus genome is actually a phage genome, MS2, which is 3.6 kb long, single-stranded RNA. I think a better way to state this is the best, the smallest known well, it's known, absolutely. It's, it's all known to... because we'll find exceptions, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. The largest viral genome, DNA, has to be this. One would think, but... Do you know how enough. big this bloody genome is? I don't. 1.2 million base pairs of DNA. And how many proteins? 1,000 1, proteins? 1,262 putative open This is open a bacteria. Stop it. This, yeah. is, this is not a virus. This bigger is a than man, it's bigger than some rickettsia. Exactly. So what does this say to you, Dick? 
well, there's a gradation of life that starts out very small and ends up very big. <laughs> so is this living? Uh, well, if it needs a cell to replicate, the listen answer to is what, no. Listen to what this genome encodes. 10% only of these proteins are known. The others are... Sure, new. off the charts. That's right. They have amino acyl tRNA synthetases, proteins involved in translation, type 1 and type 2 isom topoisomerases, components of all DNA repair pathways, many polysaccharide synthesis enzymes. It's amazing wow. what this has. And the amoeba accommodates this. I mean, it grows in the amoeba. And it actually has some eukaryotic, it has homology to eukaryotic genes. So it is probably it a nuclear is virus or it is a, a nuclear, cytoplasm? Nuclear, both. Nuclear cytoplasmic both. viruses, yes. Now, this is a virus that's so big, you could almost imagine it being infected with another virus. <laughs> could you? <laughs> yes. What do you think of that, Dick? I think that would be great if you could discover it. <gasps> and here it is. <laughs> Stop it. You guys are just overwhelming amazing? me with information. So, yes. Uh, what's that called, Alan? That is the Sputnik virophage. <laughs> so this is a, a virus that actually in itself is quite big. If you can imagine it, it, it can will only happen. grow in, in cells infected with Mimi virus. That's incredible. It won't grow by itself. It grows in amoeba with Mimi infection, but not by itself. So it's, How versatile is the Mimi virus for other things rather than amoeba? That's a good question. I was looking at that. Okay, so Mimis are implicated in, in human pneumonia. Right. It's not clear whether it causes it, but there's some association. Right. The virus will get into a number of human and mouse cells in culture, especially phagocytic cells. Mm -hmm. Genome will replicate, but I saw no indication of the production of infectious particles in, in those cells. But it amoeba, mentions a different amoeba here, too. What's that one? The other one is Acanthamoeba polyphagia. This one is Acanthamoeba castellani. Uh -huh. This is the amoeba that causes the meningioencephalitis. So when you plunge into a hot heated pond. This is right. uh, on the bottom of the pond, usually as a, it eats bacteria. It doesn't, uh, it's not really a parasite itself, but it's it's forced up through the cribriform plate, through the nose, nose yeah. and it gets into your brain. And then it, of course, the rest is history. Oh, that's bad. Amphotericin B is the only possibility. Actually, that that's not Mimi. It's actually mama virus that this virophage needs because mama is even bigger than Mimi. So that's so cool, but they call it a virophage, virus of a virus. And they claim that now this proves that the Mimi virus is living because this thing is act this actually hurts the Mimi virus. It makes defective Mimi viruses when it grows in the same cell as the Mimi virus. So this is really blurring these these edges. Not that you can't blur them. I mean, sure. you know, we make arbitrary yeah, we do. classifications. That's right. And it's just for our own purposes. So no it question. Could be, but so maybe this is a way that you could you could resolve the age old debate about whether viruses are alive. You could say something is alive <laughs> when it can be infected by a virus. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the argument here, yeah. Look, this Mimi virus will not grow unless it's in an amoeba. Yeah, but Rickettsia right. won't grow unless they're in their cells also, but Right. Not all Rickettsia. No, Some I, of them can. Dick. Most of them can't. Most so is, but a Rickettsia is considered living, right? I know. Why? I guess because it resembles a bacterium. In many of its characteristics. But a rose by any other name. I'm not going to carry this argument further because I won't, I'm not a believer in this rigidity of classification. Well, I, I'm happy to be flexible. Look, yesterday I had a conversation with Peter Palazzi and he thinks viruses are living. <laughs> That's because he's, he's a virologist. He says, he says they can uh, make copies of themselves. Sure. So they're living. Sure. I understand that. Well, people then then say, well, the crystals are living too because they can replicate in some way. But a virus on a table will sit there forever Correct. without doing anything. That's exactly right. In my right. view, that's dead. So will a fungal We're spore. living A fungal spore will do the is same Is a fungal thing. spore living? Um, a spore is not living. It depends on your definition of living, I think. Yeah, a plant seed will sit on the desk for, for years. Thousands of years. In fact, they have the original... All right, that's a bad definition. <laughs> it is a bad okay. definition. <laughs> In fact, there's no definition for life, so how can they possibly be looking for it on Mars? <laughs> so does it really matter if a virus is living or not? We just study them, right? It doesn't right. matter. It's the fact is that we're aware of them. That's what matters. We should right. waste our time on other arguments that exactly are more right. productive. But it's... this virus clearly blurs the distinction between viruses and other kinds of life, right? Excellent. And maybe it's yeah. some kind of evolutionary clue. One of the people who studies this, Eugene Koonin, this gentleman here is a bioinformatician, evolutionary virologist. Okay. He's agreed to come on TWIV and talk about this with Neat. us. So I hope you have some good questions for him. I will have some wonderful questions like, what do you know about plant viruses? He's, he's a, <laughs> you always have good questions. That's okay. Yeah, this is such a cool story. And in fact, we could have a whole episode on it and we will. 
So is there a... Wait, I have another question, and, and I probably should save this for that guy, but Acanthamoeba castigliani is a pathogen for humans. But I'm sure lots of little kids go swimming and get water up through their cribriform plate and stuff gets into their brains and they don't get sick. Mm. So maybe amoebae that have the amoebae virus are the pathogens and the ones that don't have it are not the pathogens. That's a good, that's a good idea. I don't know. There isn't enough work don't to, know. to answer that. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out here, which is really interesting. Uh, wait, before you do that, we could go back in time, though, and do a retrospective study on the brains of people who have died from acanthamoeba. If we have those brains. We have those brains. They're, they're, the sections of them are all over the place. So you could do a PCR for portions of the Mimi virus to see whether it was associated with these cases. Yeah. I hope someone is listening that might want to do that, like at the yes. Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, for instance. There's some proteins in Mimi's that actually the virophage, they are found in the Global Ocean Survey data set. Right. Now, in fact, right. I, I was reading in one of these papers that this, that data set was done with filtration that, that would remove- Is that the Craig Venter- who would remove bacteria and this virus. So all these virions <laughs> right. are removed. You but, missed them. <laughs> Dick, look, there's an article here in Nature. It says, virophage suggests viruses are alive. This is the basis of our conversation. <laughs> I see. Giant mammavirus particles and satellite viruses, virophages may be common in plankton blooms. Plankton blooms. Now, why is that, Dick? Do, do, are there amoebae in plankton blooms? No. No, no, this is uh, all coccolithic phytoplankton stuff. This is plant material, not animal material that's blooming. So, wait a minute. This says phytoplankton blooms are associated with Mimi viruses? Because they're in the ocean. The genes related to these okay, things Okay, so they, the they must infect other things besides amoebae then. Although 13 of the Sputnik genes show little similarity to other known genes, three are closely related to Mimi and Mama genes, Okay, perhaps cannibalized. This suggests that the satellite could perform horizontal gene transfer. Yep. These findings may have global implications. A metagenomic study of ocean water has revealed an abundance of genetic sequences closely related to these giant viruses, leading to a suspicion that they are a common parasite of plankton. That's where that comes from. Okay. These viruses have been missed for many years because the filters used to remove bacteria <laughs> screened out the giant viruses. That's because right. Because they're not a filterable agent. Yeah. Exactly right. Holy cow. That's right. And by the way, the, you know how they discovered the amoeba that causes the brain disease? They cultured brain tissue, of course, from these people who had died from this, and they spread it out over a layer of cells, right, to see if there were viruses involved. And they came back the next day, and there were plaques. Wow. So they said, virus. Wow. You know what? The only thing that was left on the plate were the with the amoebae. They had eaten all the cells. <laughs> mm. well, <I'll> <laughs> when they you, looked closer, they had amoebae, not cells. The, these vi this amoebae virus grows very well in acanth amoeba. Uh-huh. Polyphaga. Uh -huh. And the assay is lysis. They look right. hours after infection. Interesting. For, it's not, no plaque assay because you can't make a monolayer, obviously. But you, it's a TCID 50. Infectious dose is determined by s killing the amoeba. It's just a cure for this infection in people, then. This Mimi virus. Well, what, what if the Mimi virus causes pneumonia, Dick? I'd rather have that than a dead person. Yes. What's, what's the incidence of this? Uh, very, very, very low. Very low? Extremely low. It's associated with superheated water, so you'd, you'd have to be... Why superheated? Because it kills off everything else in the environment and allows this amoeba to grow up. It creates an environment ah. that's favoring the growth of this amoeba. I see. Otherwise, it's competition. That's correct. It that's very low levels. Cool. Yep. There we go. That's extreme virology. And you know, I, I knew we couldn't get heat extremes. You know, there are these right. thermophilic bacteria that yeah. live by the vents at the yep. bottom of the ocean, really high temperatures, but there are no viruses. But we brought hot water into this. Dick, thank right. you. Do we not know that there are virus, viruses? Not to of our those knowledge. Vent? Have we looked? I can neither confirm nor deny that right. they exist. <laughs> I would be kind of surprised if there were no viruses infecting the organisms at hydrothermal vents. It can't be true. It has to be that they are. What kind of a capsid could survive? I mean, I agree with you guys. You're absolutely right. There's... There are tube worms. There are crabs. There, there are a whole multicellular organisms right. growing That's on right. these vents. That's right. That's All right. right. They're there. So we take some of those bacteria and just induce them with mitomycin C, which pulls phages out of genomes. Or just right? sequence their genome and you've got a satellite DNA. Then that's the virus. Yeah. We have, they have to be. And I'm sure they've been sequenced. But you might not recognize the viral that's genome. Right. In that's, that's correct. The problem. Exactly. So this shows you. You've got to work on weird stuff. Did you yes. hear that uh, John McCain on Twitter this week? <laughs> yes. Oh, God. But he was trashing science, some science grants because- Yeah, in so Chicago for the planetarium. Yeah. 
So, sure. Uh, did you hear about this, Alan? We don't need to know oh, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. His, apparently, his Twitter feed is full of uh, complaints for the so-called earmarks that are in the budget. And some of the stuff he's complaining about is like, you know, classic plant breeding experiments that are that are the basis of modern agriculture. And he's calling these pork. It just, doesn't, just doesn't get it. He does doesn't. He? Well, he, he gets it. He's just being political. I, I just find that repulsive. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. This I, kind of science is great. You'd have I no you. idea. I mean, these big viruses are telling That's us right. a great deal. They you need bet. to be studied. You bet. All right, let's do some email and wrap it up, gentlemen. Okie doke. Tony writes, Hello, I have heard a fair amount of news regarding HPV and how it's effective against certain strains. It certainly makes sense to vaccinate women to reduce the chance of cervical cancer. Two things I don't understand. Why aren't young men being targeted? And why is the vaccination age for women 26 years or younger. I found your show randomly on iTunes and found it highly informative and look forward to new episodes. The last time I took a biology class was in high school and regret not taking a couple of bio courses in college. Viruses are truly amazing aspects of our environment. Thanks. Well, the reason it wasn't uh, used in men because you have to clinical trial for every use and the, the right. uh, HPV vaccine was only tried in young women. And in fact, now there is a trial in men which says that it is useful. It probably will be approved for men. So it has to be approved for every use. And the same thing with women. It was originally trialed in young women, and now it's been found that it's good for women up to 45 years of age. Hmm. So you can still get protection. So these are regulatory issues. Um, you test the vaccine in a certain population, and it's approved for that population. If you want to change it, you have to do another clinical trial and go through another. Scott writes, your articles are wonderful. If you don't mind, could you explain relative humidity a bit further? I used to think I was intelligent, but I can't wrap my brain around your relative humidity explanation. Don't feel bad, Scott. A lot of us don't understand, Vince. <laughs> well, it's look, you, this is how I see it. Uh, absolute is... Is the, is the amount of water in a volume of air. It's absolute. It's like grams per liter, okay? You got instruments, you measure it. Hotter the air, more water you can put in it, right? Yep. Relative is, is a ratio. It's how much water is in the air compared to how much could it handle at the ah, given temperature, I right? I see. So is saturation. That is it's that a, better? Yes. Think of it, a, yes. You can also think of it as a... As a uh, um, Filling a glass with water, you can say that the That's the glass is fifty percent full, sure. or you can say the glass contains fifty milliliters exactly. or a hundred milliliters, depending Very on the good. size of the glass. Absolute humidity would be the amount of water in a in a volume of air. Relative humidity is the amount relative to the amount you could put into it. Hey, right. that's good. Ho. This guy's good. <laughs> Very good, Alan. So relative humidity is a percentage. And it depends on the temperature. Right. And that's Absolute what the weatherman humidity. tells you, right? right? The relative humidity. Absolute humidity is the is the amount of water. Well, I think they tell you water. that because at some point you become uncomfortable. And when the relative humidity approaches fifty or sixty percent, then right. you start to really feel Right. But if you look at if you look at the relative humidity being fifty percent and the air temperature is forty degrees and then compare it to the relative humidity being fifty percent right, that's right, that's and the air temperature is ninety degrees. Yep, yep, yep. Um, the, the hotter air that's 50% full of water it's has a lot, a lot more, more water. water. That's exactly right. So that should do it, Scott. Now, he also asked, his daughter was tested, for inf was tested positive for influenza B, and his doctor offered Tamiflu, but he, didn't, he doesn't like the side effects. So this is an oral drug, antiviral, and has some side effects. So he said, we'll just quarantine her. What do you think? Now, we, we can't offer advice. Also, by now, by the time you hear this episode of the it's show, your late. daughter's... But I wonder day. how she tested positive for flu. I'm not aware of any office tests that people use to test for influenza. Are you gentlemen? Oh. No. So I asked him, but he didn't reply. Mike writes, I just wanted to send a word of appreciation for the great podcast. I'm a graduate student in microbiology, and this podcast lies right in the perfect niche of informative enough to seek out, but conversational enough to listen to casually. Thanks. That we have graduate students. Absolutely. Yep. Don't mess up that pipetting. <laughs> That's right. I'm a, I'm in a micro department focused in virology, but my project is much more immunologically based. I'd love to hear a podcast focused on the immunology of defense to some common uh, viruses. Maybe a focus on clearance of acute infections or maintenance of persistence. Great topic. Absolutely, we will certainly do that. I'm working on getting all kinds of interesting people on TWIV. Not like. Not the guys we have already. <laughs> this is just me. a warm-up. Yeah, including <laughs> us. Including us. This is just practice. Then he said, also, since you seem to have been recommending the occasional iPhone application, 
I've been a great evangelizer for an application called Papers for iPhone and Mac. And this is a wonderful program. I've used it. Macintosh.com. They have a program called Papers, which you can use to uh, organize all your PDFs, basically. And now there's an iPhone application. So we will put a link to that. It's a great program. Did you notice, by the way, that uh, that Bill Gates uh, will not allow iPhones in his house <laughs> and yes, iPods I either? I noticed that. His <laughs> wife can't have an iPod or That's an iPhone. Right. And his daughter. But when I was at TED, by the way, <laughs> and he sat down for a conversation, Conversation with Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson's laptop was an Apple computer, and the crowd went hysterical. And neither one on the stage knew why we were laughing, but we could all oh, see that's that. Great. That's great. Here's precious. Bill Gates Jr. sitting on the stage discussing some something about malaria, and uh, Chris Anderson is there taking notes, and he's doing it on a laptop that's, that's an that's Apple. That's terrific. It was fantastic. Uh, well, it's a better machine. I think it is actually. And his wife should be able, his daughter should be able to have an iPod, and she should put Twiv on it. This is absolutely. You know, you betcha. So anyway, Papers is great. Yes, we like Papers. I like it very much. And um, he says the app functions as iTunes for your journal articles. That's true. On his Mac, he has his entire collection with easily searchable by author journals, publication date. And then if you take it on the iPhone, you can carry a a subset of papers with you to look at and so forth. So thanks for that. Uh, We'll we'll, uh, post that. Now we have our picks of the week. Aha. Now, here we go. Science blog of the week. This blog is called, simply, H5N1 <laughs> by a, a fellow, fellow named Croft. Croft is an interesting fellow. He uh, he follows our work here uh, and makes nice comments, so I appreciate it. Croft was born in New York in 1941, went to Columbia. My age. Columbia, 62. So and, did I. Uh, he's in Canada now and has done some teaching and writing, and he's writing books and articles. And Great. He... Uh, basically tracks what's going on with H5N1 at this wow. uh, blog. And I have a feeling a lot of people read it. So he's giving them good information. Mm-hmm. You should have a look at it. It's a nice job. I think it's an example of a civilian doing uh, a nice service. He's interested in writing and uh, he's collecting this info. There are a couple of other sites that do this, but I like Croft. Nice. Science Podcast of the Week is our is from our friends at ASM. It's called Microbe World Video. Ah. Short videos on the latest in microbiology. And our friend Chris Condayan, who is the voice behind the ads from ASM, he does these videos. So good job, Chris. Those are nice. And finally, our Science Book of the Week. Autism's False Prophets. Bad Science, Risky Medicine, and the Search for a Cure. Paul A. Offit, MD. Published by... Columbia University Press. Columbia University. Not a bad little organization, actually. Yeah, but had something published there? Almost. Anyway, this is a fabulous book. It's about the autism, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine controversy, which we've talked about and you've heard about. This is a book which goes through the whole story. It's really well done. He's a smart guy. He knows the field. He's actually, uh, he's the developer of the rotavirus vaccine. Really? He's written several other books. Really? One of which was a um, book we picked before the Cutter incident. He wrote that. And this is fabulous. And the reason I am I finally read it, we mentioned it a couple months ago on TWIV, and I said I wanted to read it first. And I read it, and it's fabulous. If you're still not convinced that vaccines are safe, you need to read this book. And you should also listen. There is a podcast between him and, and Dr. Ginger Campbell of the Brain Science Podcast. And she was our first science podcast pick of the week in episode, I don't know, six or something when we started doing this. Cool. And it's a great podcast. He makes great points. I'll put a link to that, and you should listen to it. It's really good, but a great book. And I sent him an email and uh, said, thank you for this. This is a great service. He said, oh, sure. I said, maybe we'll get him on Twiv one day to talk about rotaviruses. Sure. That'd be great. And there are so also some good science podcasts at sciencepodcasters.org, which is Dr. Campbell's site, and promednetwork.com. That'll do it, gentlemen. Twiv will be live at ASM. Are you coming, Dick? Of course I am. Alan, you might come, right? I am I am planning to come, yes. You will come. Excellent. Yes. I put out a couple of invitations to prominent virologists, so we'll see if they come. 2 p.m. Tuesday, May 19th. Live video cast and recorded for TWIV. www.asm.org. Meeting details. Yeah, we'll have a cheesesteak afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> www.twiv.tv. If you want to follow us on Twitter, P R O F V R R, or Alan Dove, and we're waiting for Dick to get a Twitter handle. Send us your questions or comments, twiv at twiv.tv. I have experiments to run. There is research to be done. Anything else, gentlemen? Not from this end. Not from me. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, the podcasts about viruses that may or may not make you sick. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We will certainly be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.